I had one <laughs> finger in the gill, and I was all the way at the bottom of the hole. Sled dogging for lake trout doesn't get any better than this. It's almost like ballet. When you watch the team and a team that's been running together, they're in complete sync. They're walking along the trail and they noticed spots of orange that were floating in the creek. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels, featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Anybody find the keys yet? So it, it, as soon as we find our truck keys here, we're gonna go do probably the coolest thing of this trip. We've been up here in Ely for a couple of days. We spent time on the Gunflint Trail. We've gotten to do some really cool things, but today may be the best. We're gonna go dog sledding with Ryan Miller from Underdog and uh, try to catch some lake trout on, uh, on burnt side as soon as we find the keys for the truck. Did anybody put them back here? I've gotten more and more fascinated with lake trout. So I'm anxious to get over to the lake to meet up with Ryan and his friends. All right, so this is gonna be my lead dog today. This is your lead dog, this is Spider. Oh yeah, oh, he, he likes, likes you already. Me. Oh yeah, buddy. He's uh, eight and a half, nine years old and he's been running lead for me for as long as I've been doing sled dogs. Oh, yeah. I, he was one of my first dogs and he's been my, uh, by far my most solid leader. Perfect. Um, so I got the A-team today. You got the A-team today, yeah. yeah. And even though I haven't been around dog sledding very much, I've been around plenty of dogs to know they like a good ear scratch. Hike means go, G means right, haw means left, wo means stop. Okay. So he knows. Easy enough. He knows all that stuff. Ready to do this, Spider? Huh? Good boy, Ready spider. to do this? Yeah? Okay, so there's just essentially just a couple of things you really need to know to be able to come out here and do this for fun on a day like this. And you need to, need to know how to slow down and stop your sled. So there's like old snowmobile track basically that you can step on down here like this and you can kind of ride it to slow you down a little bit. And then right in front of that, you can see is the, the hard brake. So it's got a couple of um, spikes essentially that you can push down and that'll, that'll cut down into that snow and you can stop there. And then when you're stopped like this, you've got a rope with a big hook that you can put into the ground and that'll keep the dogs from taking the sled. But what may be the most important part, the most important equipment on a dog sled is this rope right here. Because when you fall off of this thing, if you were to fall off, a lot of times this is what you can grab as it's uh, going by and grab it. It is said that there's evidence of domestic dogs being used to pull sleds that goes back 9,000 years. The genetics passed down from sled dog to sled dog can be seen in the behavior of the animals we have today. The explosive energy and the desire to run is almost hard to handle for anyone outside the sled dog culture and even harder for others to understand. But get on a sled and give these dogs the command to go 
and you'll quickly see that this is what they love to do more than anything in the world. Just like that, the dogs go silent, with the exception of the soft plodding of their pads and the glide of the sled's runners across the snow. These are the moments you remember on a trip like this. Happy dogs pulling you through the snowy landscape. While weaving through the islands on Burntside Lake can be a breathtaking experience in itself, we had another uniquely Northern Minnesota experience planned. It was time to start chasing Lakers. So we've come to a spot here where you can see behind me, uh, kind of next down to a channel, there's some islands and shoreline here that are necking down. So there's probably gonna be uh, some pretty good structure under the ice here for lake trout. So we're gonna get a couple holes drilled. We're gonna get the dog situated, get our gear out, see if we can't catch some fish. Ryan is from Madison, Minnesota. After living in Idaho, he found himself moving to Ely and working with the Forest Service. I love it. The, the culture is awesome. The people are really great. Um, and the opportunities you have uh, four million acres of Superior National Forest you can hunt and fish and recreate in. Uh, Chippewa National Forest is just south of us an hour. Uh, you've got a million, uh, about, a, about a million acres there. Um, lots of state ground. You just have a ton of outdoor opportunities up in this area. And that's uh, never a shortage of things to do if you like hunting, fishing, recreating in the outdoors. Not to mention the big wilderness we're right next to, the Boundary Waters. Well, the largest uh, wilderness area east of the Mississippi. Um, a ton of opportunities here. Uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time here in the summer. I like it better in the winter because you have almost all the Boundary Waters to yourself. If you don't mind the cold and the snow and have dogs to take you wherever you want to go, it's, it's great, it's awesome, you can't beat it. Well, we got to our spot here. Uh, we're just drilling holes around the area right now. We're gonna set out some tip-ups in some of these. I always like to try to fish the first hole and just see, just see what happens, see what's there. So we're gonna get hooked up and drop down. So we're pretty far off the beaten track. Um, as you guys can see, there's nothing around us. Um, I chose this spot because it's a nice long section of narrows. We're kind of in the narrowest pinch point of these narrows. We got an island right here and the shoreline's right there. We got tip-ups all surrounding our lines that we're fishing. So pretty much if anything comes through here, they got to at least look at one of our lines. I'm definitely marking fish down here on the bottom. I just had one come right up to my jig didn't like what he saw and went back down to the bottom. And it looked like there was actually a second fish there too. So if I get the same kind of reaction out of these fish, I'm gonna have to try a different hook. Here we go, here we go. Fish on! <laughs> you can see by the bend of my rod, how much of a fight even a small lake trout will put up. Oh yeah, everybody's excited now. The dogs are excited. We've been marking fish in this spot the entire time since we've been here. We've had a lot of action, but no takers. I've tried bigger baits, smaller baits, noisier baits, until finally tying on a pink hyperglide and tipping it with a minnow tail, which you'll see popped out as the fish came up the hole. Save them. Oh, ho, ho. Nice! <laughs> I had one finger in the gill and I was all the way at the bottom of the hole. Sled dogging for lake trout doesn't get any better than this, folks. It really doesn't matter what your outdoor adventure is, as long as you bring a team of sled dogs with you. But just working with the dogs, you know, all these dogs come in the house and uh, my kids love the dogs, some of them sleep in the house sometimes not every night but you know if it's a really cold night we'll let a few dogs inside to sleep oh flag up all right so obviously ryan's here fishing but we got another flag up over here so we're gonna see see if we can't pull up another fish up out of the hole here lake trout are actually char in fact the largest of the chars with the record being nearly 102 pounds caught in a gill net in saskatchewan it, you know traditionally in the boundary waters and with, with the dogs, you know, I mean, you're, you can fish, ton of great trout fishing in the boundary waters, you know, or, I mean, obviously in this, in this area as well. 
Minnesota is one of only a few states with naturally reproducing lake trout populations. According to the Minnesota DNR, our 116 lake trout lakes is second in number only to Alaska. It's lunchtime, got some brats cooked over an open fire here on a stick. Doesn't get any better than this. I know I've said that about four or five times on this when you're talking about dog sleds, lake trout fish in northern Minnesota, and brats on a stick. It doesn't get any better than that, man. Oh, yeah. Mm. The aggression they have. Um, you can get stubborn fish, but boy, when you got that lake trout that comes in and he's committed, you can't line your jig up fast enough to keep it away from it. But when you're ripping that up as fast as you can and that lake trout comes and hits it, peels your rod over just while rips it out of your hand, doesn't get any better than that. Well, there's fish all over the place down here. Come on, just eat it. Marking two different fish down here right now. I got two of them that are chasing me like 15 feet. Oh, he's back. Oh, come on. There we go, fish on. But well, we were just about to give up, pack up, go home. And man, I've just had two different lake trout down there, just all sorts of excited. And I worked them up and down, up and down, a good 15 to 20 feet off the bottom. And this guy finally came in and smashed it. Here he comes. There we go. Nice. Cool colors on these Lakers here. We got that kind of that gold tint to them. And of course that uh, color of fish, a lot of times depends on that color of the water, the environment they're in, the depth that they're in. And uh, that's a real pretty Northern Minnesota lake trout right there. So there's my two Lakers for the day. It's time to get back on the dog sleds. That's one thing, if you look at the map up here, I call it Swiss cheese. I mean, there's just lakes after lakes after lakes. Um, you don't have to be in the boundary waters. I do most of my fishing outside the boundary waters. That's the beauty of a northern Minnesota adventure. You got a lot of options. Different lakes to choose from, different species to chase. Heck, you don't even have to go fishing. Yeah, we go camping all the time. I take people uh, for overnight trips or just day trips. Or you could just go trail riding. And that's what we're gonna do on our way back. And I'm pretty excited about it. For the next hour or so, dogs tethered to my sled were able to run wide open through the snowy expanse. Dogs with names like Spider, Luna, Moon, Soccer, Chainsaw, and Tupac. Modern names doing the same jobs their ancestors did thousands of years ago. Running a team of dogs can be really relaxing. It can also be quite the rush. This opportunity for you to get deep into the wilderness with just a team of dogs and some lake trout is something everyone should experience. That was awesome. Yeah, dude. Man, when you get uh, 12, 15 miles out into the boundary waters and 
sunset and you get to watch the sunrise the next day. Sometimes the northern lights are out. Wolves will haul back and forth with the dogs. Sometimes it's a, you, you can't beat that. That's uh, about the one of the best experiences you can have, in my opinion. The best part is the part we don't see here at the start. The best part is just being out in the woods and it's silent and you know, we're just traveling around. And they get into the waters and there's enough food, they're gonna follow their natural instinct and spawn and... Northern Minnesota's history has long been intertwined with the outdoor world. And like the trusty companions they are, dogs have had a big part of it. That's certainly evident in the small recreational town of Ely. Sled dogs are a vibrant part of life today for residents and visitors alike. While you hear more about the popular sled dog races of Northern Minnesota, today we're gonna learn more about the role sled dogs play as ambassadors to the region, as well as an important part of the workforce. In 1970, the All-American Championship race was a race here in Ely. It started before the Iditarod or the Bear Grease or anything, and it was the largest race in the lower 48 states. North Star Sled Dog Club yeah. from mid the Minneapolis area, actually, who got the race started in Ely. And I, it, it had been running almost 10 years by the time I actually raced it the first time. And what made it the race it was because once we got that, the first bunch of teams in, we had the best trails in the United States, probably North America. So that's what the mushers want. And we want them, or the town wants them, for the business. So Ely isn't very busy in the middle of the winter. But one guy went around and interviewed all the people in Bidger and they spent a million eight hundred thousand in Ely. Yeah, on that one, one weekend. While the All-American Championship race was a success, it mysteriously disappeared after 21 years in 1992. In 2008, the Ely Chamber of Commerce came together to establish the Wolf Track Classic sled dog race, now in its 12th year. So it had been a long, many years since a race had been run, and so we thought that we really needed to have a dog sled race in Ely again. And being that it was also proclaimed to be the dog sled capital of America by the mayor back in 1982. Racing is a ton of fun. I uh, kind of got kind of got hooked into the race and stuff last year. I did this race last year, and that was my first race ever. And uh, now I'm kind of hooked on the race and stuff. The best part is the part we don't see here at the start. The best part is just being out in the woods and it's silent and you know, we're just traveling around and you know the wildlife just sees us as another part of the woods and you know so we get right up to moose all the time and wolves and you know we're seeing wildlife everywhere. Dog sledding is on a lot of folks bucket list at least to either watch it or we have several guide programs here in Ely. It's a big boost to the economy. Yeah, there's a number of dog sledding lodges. Um, people fly in from all over. We get people from, you know, from all over the United States and other countries that come in just for dog sledding. People as from as far away as Japan come to go dog sledding here. <laughs> can get guided trips like this and we can come out to a lake. We can go after lake trout, stream trout, walleye, northern, we can go spearing for northern. Um, you name it, the possibilities are endless. And with this dog sled team, um, you can get way back in the beaten track. I mean, we can get 16 miles up in the boundary waters, we can go up and uh, hit up Knife Lake. Possibilities are endless with the dogs. Work for the U.S. Forest Service. And in the summer times I fight fires and then in the winter time I freight 
boards and latrines, fire grates and whatnot with the dog sleds into the boundary water. What we use them for in the forest service, you know, for what I do, you know, in my job, um, they're extremely practical because of the amount of weight that we can pull in. So like the project that I just finished, we hauled 40 boards into a lake to replace an existing rotten boardwalk that's out on one of the portages. And, you know, I would, just an estimate, you know, I'd say that if somebody was trying to do that in a canoe, it would probably take two people, maybe two weeks, you know, three weeks, maybe a month. And with the dogs, we did it in four days. So the efficiency behind, you know, the dogs in a non-motorized area is, you know, you can't, can't replace that. All of my dogs are volunteers with the Forest Service. So they, we signed an agreement, you know, at the beginning of the dog sledding season and they are all labeled as volunteers. When we're running dogs in the boundary waters for the Forest Service, yeah, they're, they're the volunteers and then I, I, I'm the employee, you know. We have a pretty good program. We have over, well over 500 miles in freighting projects alone this year in the boundary waters. It's one of my favorite ways to go. You can go pretty much anywhere you want. Your sled dogs will never break down on you. <laughs> you know, they're always ready to go. And it's almost like ballet. When you watch the team and a team that's been running together, they're in complete sync. It's, it's, it's like pair bonding for wolves. Their gates are the same. Their bodies are smooth. It looks effortless, actually. But you still can't really beat a day especially like this, running out into uh, the boundary waters around here. From racing to working and everything in between, no matter what you're doing, dogs just make everything better. Last April, Carver County water management staff were out on a routine water quality check of Big Woods Lake when they noticed strange flashes of orange in an inlet. They were walking along the trail and they noticed spots of orange that were floating in the creek by the uh, hundreds. They looked closer and discovered the orange spots were goldfish that are not native to Minnesota. A lot of them are hidden because they're the darker color, the grays and the browns. Um, so they noticed the orange, but then when they looked deeper, they saw the thousands of fish underneath that as well. The most likely scenario is someone had a pet and they released it into the water thinking they were doing the humane thing and took a couple of them, probably found each other and they tend to reproduce pretty rapidly and because they have no natural predators, again, there's nothing to control the population so the population can expand pretty quickly. Another option is that it could have been a bait release. So. We try to educate people that goldfish are not native species, they're aquatic invasive species, and so they compete with our natural fish and wildlife for food and shelter. Um, they cause a lot of disruptions to our lakes because they are related to carp, so they tend to be bottom feeders and they stir up a lot of those sediments and they release phosphorus into our lakes and rivers and that phosphorus then can turn into algae blooms or can cause algae blooms. I'm not a fish expert but I don't think they're terribly picky about habitat so or or water requirements like zebra mussels you know they have to have so much um, of a certain chemical in the water to really take over but goldfish are they're hardy they can survive fluctuations in temperature in the water so they survived this past winter with all of our polar vortexes so I don't, I mean, I don't think they're terribly picky if the habitat's right and they get into the waters and there's enough food, they're going to follow their natural instinct and spawn and reproduce and take over. Goldfish can grow to a foot long and live 25 years. And while the thousands discovered near Chaska has captured the media's attention, the invasive species has also been found near Richfield and Chanhassen. And they're trying to deal with them in a number of different lakes. I think the the impact of this one or the intention on this one was because they were so confined to a small space and so visual in such large numbers that that really grabbed the attention of the media and the public. We're just in like the first steps of discussions with other partners to talk about how to deal with the water quality issues and how to deal with the goldfish issues. 
One of the things we're looking at, uh, the project I mentioned, would be a drawdown. So you would draw down the water in the lake um, to almost gone, and that would allow that phosphorus to be removed from that water body, and it would also address the goldfish issue because there would be no water in the lake. Big Woods is part of a chain of five lakes, so eradicating goldfish will be an enormous engineering feat. The public can help by not adding more to our waterways. Don't flush them down a toilet or dump them into a stream. And don't think you're helping out by capturing goldfish for your home aquarium. So we wanted people to know it is against Minnesota state law to transport live fish. So you can't come here, you can't pick the goldfish up and take them home as a pet because you can't transport live fish. But if you have a fishing license, you can come fish for the goldfish with like a hook and a line. Um, you just can't transport them live. What we try to do is tell people if they have a goldfish or another type of aquarium pet and they don't want it or they can't take care of it, we encourage them to find it another home. Give it away, donate it, um, you can surrender it. There's surrender events through the Minnesota Aquarium Society. Or you could just check with your local veterinarian or pet store and see what options you have. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels, featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. <laughs>